In France for the 16th century, there was a huge amount of tension between the Catholics and the Protestants, and it erupted into an all-out civil war. But one of the most famous outbreaks of violence that caused this to move towards ultimate civil war in France was called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and it occurred during Shakespeare's lifetime. So that's what we're going to discuss right now on that Shakespeare life is what exactly was the history of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. In order to try and ease the tensions between the Catholics and the Protestants, Catherine de' Medici proposed a marriage. Marriages were famous for solving problems and quelching wars. And I guess she thought she was going to head this off by orchestrating a marriage between Henry Navarre and her daughter, Margaret Valois. This was, you know, hey, let them get married and all the tensions will go away. This was actually a really surprising choice in my mind since Henry was Protestant and Margaret was Catholic. So the marriage was controversial in and of itself. Catherine de Medici had to work really hard to even find a priest that was willing to perform the ceremony. The French Protestants were known as the Huguenots and the wars between the Catholics and the Huguenots lasted over 36 years. And it only ended when Henry IV was crowned king of France and issued the Edict of Nantes. Now, there was actually a lot of time between him being crowned and the Edict of Nantes, but the Edict of Nantes was what brought about at least temporary peace between the Protestants and the Catholics by giving the French Protestants a lot of rights in France. Now, as a side note here, for because we are Shakespeare historians, if you're familiar with Shakespeare's history plays, you're going to recognize a lot of the names associated with this part of history. And so I want to clear up some potential confusion points for you. The Valois family that you hear me mention is the Valois that shows up in Shakespeare's Henry plays. But the Margaret Valois that married Henry IV is the same Valois family that we get Catherine Valois that oh so romantically marries Henry V of England in Shakespeare's plays. You may have also heard of Henry IV from Shakespeare's plays, but the Henry IV in Shakespeare's Henry plays is Henry IV of England, also known as Henry Bolingbroke. And he features in the Henry ad plays. It's a really cool story. That's a really cool Henry, but it's not the one we're talking about in association with the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. The St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre associated Henry IV is the French Henry IV of France. Fantastically, this was a man who was contemporary to Shakespeare. I just think that's really cool. These issues that we're talking about here were the current world events for William Shakespeare. And true to form for Shakespeare, he was writing about current political events in his plays. So he does use this current event in his plays using the real Henry IV of France as the basis for his character named Ferdinand, King of Navarre. You'll see this character show up in Love's Labor's Lost, which was written around the same time the Edict of Nantes was signed. So hopefully that gives you a little context for keeping track of your Henry's and your Shakespeare history. Now, after the Edict of Nantes was signed, there was relative peace, but that peace was ultimately short-lived because later in the mid-17th century, the Catholics would stir up the trouble again. The tensions would again erupt into more wars, but fleshing all that history out is too much for today's episode. So for now, we're just going to focus on this one piece of Shakespeare's lifetime. After Catherine de' Medici orchestrates the wedding of Catholic Margaret Valois with Huguenot Henry Navarre, Henry becomes king of France, and his closest advisor is a Protestant named Admiral Gaspard de Coligny. He stays in Paris with a few of the leading Huguenot um, leaders, and he talks over some grievances they have about the treatment of Huguenots in France, thinking that, you know, they have a sympathetic ear here, so they kind of want to get a start on making some changes. So they're talking with the the king about this. Now, Coligny was the most respected Huguenot leader in France, and while he was big chums with Henry, Margaret's mother, Catherine, stayed suspicious of him. 
And a few days after this chat about the grievances, Colini was on his way home and someone shoots him from an upstairs window. And now Colini is seriously wounded. And it was kind of a JFK situation because no one knows, even still today, exactly who it was that shot him. There was a list of prime suspects. There were people that they thought were really good for this, but they never could nail it to anybody in particular. But regardless of who shot him, the fact that someone attempted to assassinate this high ranking Huguenot leader in infuriated the Protestants who saw Colini as a representative and it was an attack on all of them for them to have attacked Colini. This sent all the tensions that the marriage had tried to quelch back up into the air and the Catholics are now worried that the Protestants are going to retaliate for the shooting of Colini and the Protestants are seriously considering it because they're very upset right now. And it didn't help matters that the Protestants stormed into the royal residences to make threatening comments or that Colini's brother had an army posted outside the city. The situation was tense, to say the least. Now, Catherine de' Medici sees all this going on, and she decides she's going to handle the situation by gathering up some Catholic leaders and deciding essentially to issue what was the biggest, largest mob hit ever recorded. She decides we need to take out all the Protestant leaders, just kill them. Now, some historians estimate that there was anywhere from two to three dozen noblemen Protestant noblemen in France, but it wasn't just killing them because if you killed the leaders, you also had to kill their entourage of assistants, worker bees, or people that are connected to them in this cloud of connections that they had. So it was, she was proposing taking out quite a few people just all at once. And after they made this decision, they call in the local authorities and order the police essentially to shut the gates and arm the citizens to prevent any Protestant uprising that they think is going to happen. So they totally use the fear there to say, oh, they're about to cause a big to do. You need to, you know, fight back against this. From here, the details are a little vague about exactly the order of things, but there was a group of Swiss mercenaries that were in service to the king, and they get called out to haul in a bunch of Protestant leaders, and they drag them into the streets of Paris and just slaughter them in the middle of the street. No trial, no anything. They just kill them. And then after this occurred, the common people of Paris rise up and began to hunt Protestants throughout the city, including women and children. It was it was horrible. They would use chains to block streets so that Protestants couldn't escape their houses. They're essentially trapping them and killing them wherever they find them. And then the bodies of the dead are collected into carts and thrown into the Seine River there in Paris. There are wide estimates on the number of total casualties at the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre, but it was in the thousands, if not tens of thousands across France. In Paris alone, they have a few hard figures to work with, including a payment to a city worker who collected and buried over a thousand bodies that washed up on the banks of the Seine downstream in Paris, that was in one week he gathered up that many. So they know that the the sheer number of deaths in Paris on this day and associated with this massacre was enormous. It was a really horrible situation. Even Ivan the Terrible, keep in mind, this is a guy whose literal name is Terrible, condemned the Bartholomew Day massacre as a horrendous act. That's when you know you've crossed a really big line there. The massacre caused a major international crisis. Protestant countries were horrified at these events, and it came very close to home for Elizabeth I because her ambassador to France at the time was Sir Francis Walsingham, and he was a Protestant. So when this broke out in Paris, he barely escaped with his life. He was one of the people that they tried to kill during this event. The whole situation rapidly deteriorates until France is in an open civil war. And at this point, France is seeking foreign aid, including seeking help from England and Elizabeth I. The refugees fleeing France are looking for anywhere to go because they can't stay in France if they're Protestant at this point. So they come to England, which is a Protestant country right next door. And they even end up in Canterbury, where Elizabethan playwright Christopher Marlowe lived. And this is where it hits home for the life of William Shakespeare, because Christopher Marlowe was a contemporary playwright to Shakespeare. They worked together, they knew each other, and you can read more about the history of Christopher Marlowe and his connections to Shakespeare in some of the links I'll put below this video. We've covered it on our podcast, but Marlowe was strongly 
anti-Catholic and anti-French, or at least he was when he wrote the play, The Massacre at Paris. He has the characters of Guise and Catherine being bent on evil from the very beginning. Yes, that is a direct nod to the Catherine de' Medici who orchestrated these events. Now, the event not only rocked the European world to its core, but it seems to have impacted Shakespeare directly. In a recent exhibition by the Folger Shakespeare Library, a copy of the play Sir Thomas More that Shakespeare contributed to is on display, and a surviving section of this play is handwritten by William Shakespeare himself. Now, this is remarkable on its own because we just don't have a lot of surviving handwritten items from William Shakespeare. In fact, aside from this piece of the play, the only ones we have are signatures on various documents. So this is like the only handwritten thing of Shakespeare's that we have. And it's a section where he has Sir Thomas More calling on the crowds to empathize with the immigrants and pleading with the crowds to not slaughter all these people. He uses the phrase mountainous inhumanity of it all. And these are some ways that understanding the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre is... It's really just one example of how understanding the history that was going on during Shakespeare's lifetime makes his plays and his life make more sense. You don't appreciate the pleading of Sir Thomas More against the mountainous inhumanity if you don't understand exactly what the events were that were going on to cause that kind of plea to be necessary. But that is a direct example of how we know this event definitely impacted Shakespeare and was a part of his life. Now, this was all just a basic introduction to a story that has many, many nuances and much, much more details to uncover. So if you would like to dive further in with my notes and recommended reading and links to places you can begin, if you want to learn even more about the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre, check out the behind the scenes guide that goes along with today's show posted on our Patreon page. Links for that are below this video. That's it for this week. I'm Cassidy Cash. I hope you learned something new about the Bard. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.